I don't know if the warrior ethos defines Sergeant Smith or Sergeant Smith defines the warrior ethos. I think they're synonymous now. He put his life out there in line to bring his platoon home. He could have very well easily ordered another soldier to get up there and do it, but instead he was up there himself making sure that the rest of us got home. He was hard in training because he knew we had to be hard in battle. And he never let us just settle for second best. If somebody messes up, people die. And Smitty believed that to his very core. He would not let one of our guys go untrained. Accomplish the mission? You wanted something done, Smitty was the man you called for anything. I don't care how big or small. He didn't know how to fail. Sergeant First Class Paul Ray Smith was known as a tough NCO, one who asked a lot of his soldiers. But in a battle on a hazy 2003 morning just outside Baghdad's airport, Sergeant Smith's soldiers learned that he demanded even more of himself. That day, the 33-year-old combat engineer made a conscious choice placing the lives of his soldiers above his own. It was a choice that earned Sergeant Smith our nation's highest award for valor, the Medal of Honor. Paul Smith grew up in Tampa, Florida. He liked sports, skateboarding, riding bikes, and particularly football. He enjoyed playing pranks on his younger sister, Lisa. If there was one thing that set him apart, it was his determination, first displayed at the age of five when he made up his mind what he wanted to be when he grew up. From the time Paul was about five years old, he thought he'd tell everybody he was gonna be a soldier. But I just kind of figured that's typical of a child, you know. And so we never really thought much about it. But anytime anyone asked him, he always said, I'm going to be a soldier. Paul's decision to become a soldier from such an early point in life is only one of many examples of the determination and drive he displayed. Extending from his home life to work, even to a well-loved hobby he wasn't even good at. He couldn't catch a tin can in the water, but he would go out every weekend on the bridges, anywhere he could find water and throw a pole in. And when he did catch a fish, it was like he had just found a diamond ring in the water. Then one evening in the fall of 1989, Paul showed up at home with a big announcement for his parents. Uh, he says, I joined the military. <laughs> I said, really? Just, like that. Just yeah. like that. And I will never, ever forget him getting on that motorcycle, putting on that helmet, and he just, he looked so happy. Basic training at Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri wasn't quite what Paul expected, as he wrote in many letters home to mom. Saying, this is really hard. You know, they're really mean. I miss your food, Mom. Finally, graduation day arrived. We walked over to where he was sitting, and he looked at me. And the smile, the pride in his smile, is something I'll never forget. In fact, I took a picture of that smile, and that's one of my favorite oh, yeah, pictures. Picture, yeah. As a young soldier, Paul didn't do much to stand out from the crowd. He was more interested in hanging out with friends near his post in Bamberg, Germany. Then, one night in June 1990, Paul met 23-year-old Birgit Bacher, a night she'll always remember. Because he was underneath my um, hotel room window and sung, You Lost a Loving Feeling, on one knee. So that's a very special moment. In November 1990, Paul's unit got word they were heading to Saudi Arabia to support Operation Desert Storm. Paul and his fellow combat engineers deployed, and he and Birgit lost touch. Although details of what Paul experienced during Desert Storm are sketchy, even to his loved ones, those who knew him best noticed profound changes when he returned home. There was just a pain in his eyes that never went away after that. And so when, when he came back, he had made a decision to really make the Army important. He said no soldier should ever go into war without having had the very best training. 
In the fall of 1991, Paul was back in Germany. Eventually, he and Birgit crossed paths again, and it wasn't long before plans were in the works for a wedding. Paul and Birgit married on January 24, 1992, when Paul also became stepfather to Birgit's daughter, Jessica. In March 1994, Paul and Birgit had a son, David. He was a very devoted husband and, and father. For him, family was pretty much everything. Go. Hold on to it. It's too go. small for him. On his first birthday, David was introduced to Paul's favorite hobby. David came to love fishing and had much better luck than his dad. I was the first one to catch something. And then they would come to my grandpa catching a fish, my dad catching nothing, but helping me. He was not good, but he loved to just throw out the reel, wait there, and catch nothing. Meanwhile, Paul's post-Gulf War determination to be the best and demand the best grew, and his soldiers were on the receiving end. We ran a battle drill once. I swear it must have been three hours. We were the simplest battle drill in the world, marking a lane in a minefield. Well, Smitty said you can get it under three minutes. First time we tried it, it was seven minutes. Second time we tried it, it was a little bit less. We were out there for about three hours. Guys were dog tired, and we finally got it down to under three minutes, just like he said. He was hard in training because he knew we had to be hard in battle, and he never let us just settle for second best. He always made us do the best we could. Paul put the same pressures to excel on himself as he did his platoon, jumping at any opportunity that would make him a better soldier and leader. As a result, he spent a lot of time away from his family. Paul was, uh, through our marriage, most of the time gone, through school, deployments, and so on, and long hours. I mean, we didn't get to see a lot of him, but when he was home, you know, he made the best out of it, the most out of it. <laughs> In January 2003, Paul's unit began preparations for deployment to Kuwait as part of the 3rd Infantry Division's buildup for Operation Iraqi Freedom. They would soon be on their way to the Persian Gulf to face the military forces of Saddam Hussein. Paul's parents say he was a different man as he prepared to leave for another combat assignment. Paul did things out of character before he left. Paul could care less about big screen TVs, expensive cars. Uh, he didn't care about having a lot of material things. But before he left, he went out and bought the family a big screen TV. He had bought his wife some pearls for their anniversary, which he knew he wouldn't be there for. And like when we saw him the last time, I had commented on a ring he had on. And I said, oh, that's new. I said, that's really nice. He says, here, Mom. I've never had it off my finger it's since he gave it come to off, me. I know. And that's the last thing he gave me. And in retrospect, sitting back, thinking about when he left, yeah. I think he knew that he would meet his destiny in Iraq. When recon continues, a battle that costs so much, yet saves so many. The sky was gray, full of smoke, and all you heard was firefights and explosions going on around you. 